Yes. Good night, everybody. I'm happy to be here with you. I've been, uh, we came from Marseille today with Thomas, which is a train and tomorrow we leave. And uh, that was a very short uh, uh, journey here to Barcelona. Actually, we came here two years, no, three years ago, just 10 days before the lockdown. Uh, we had a face to face meeting with the entire Vertex team in Barcelona. It was a great time. Right, let's start. You came with Tabernet, no? No, I came uh, with the train. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, tonight I'm going to talk to you about uh, the work I've been doing a few years ago that is still ongoing, but not too much. And it, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about framework benchmarks and uh, performance and how we did improve performance in Vertex. So this is, um, you can see the date, uh, it's March 28th, 2013. So uh, that, that's a website that's called Decompor. I don't know if you are familiar with that website. But basically what they do is that they, they started at this time to benchmark HTTP servers and frameworks, uh, just because uh, sometimes it's important to know uh, the performance of the server you are going to use. Uh, of course, we all heard the stories about uh, people that, uh, well, that's what you do, right? When the website is not responsive, right? If you wait and see what do you do? I personally, I close the tab or I will try that uh, for me it's too late. <laughs> or I try to find another alternative or something else. Um, so this benchmark, uh, it started to, to, they started to, Basically, it's a company, it's a service company, and started to take framework benchmarks, uh, so framework servers and servers, and this, they wrote a simple benchmark um, that takes uh, all the servers in different languages, and um, they just compare performance in various situations. Uh, you can see, by the way, that at this time uh, it was round one, so the first round. Today, now, now we are, I think, at round 22. Uh, Vertex was already ranked. That, that was the third fastest uh, HTTP server uh, at this time. Uh, so it was just a bunch of servers comparing various technologies. Not many, uh, not many servers actually. And uh, now these days, um, this benchmark can. I'm not saying it's a good benchmark, but it's a popular benchmark. And uh, nowadays, uh, everybody when is, is writing a web server or a web framework, he will uh, submit uh, his, uh, his work to be compared against the other. So what they do basically is that they host their uh, three servers, and on the three servers, they run the benchmark, and uh, they have like a continuous integration. And uh, you get to meet your own benchmark if you want, by the way. And it's a GitHub repo, you fork it, you add uh, uh, your project, uh, whatever language, but also the data that are required at the description. And then you submit it, the request is accepted after some time. And then your benchmark will be, your server will be, uh, will be uh, accepted. Uh, so there are seven tests. Uh, two of them uh, don't use a database. Uh, uh, and the other are using a database, and there are very strict requirements. Like, uh, if you are using a database, you cannot touch data, for instance. Uh, you have to always go to the database and then send the result. Uh, you have to send the specific headers in the response to ensure that nobody is cheating. But everything actually is open source. So it means uh, not open source, is also the benchmark is, is open, so uh, people can look at what is how the benchmark is written, not how the HTTP server is written, but how the benchmark is written. But most of the time, those are all uh, open source servers, so anybody can have a look inside and uh, check. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm coming from Marseille and Julien Viet. I've been, uh, as uh, Andrew said, I've been uh, actually at my entire uh, work life, I would say. Uh, I've been writing open source software starting in 2003 for JBoss. And uh, now I'm still doing that. And I'm a principal software engineer after that. Uh, and I'm also I'm coming from Marseille, and as I said, I'm uh, also Marseille job leader. So if you have something interesting to say, you are coming by nearby to Marseille. Of course, you are welcome to, to ping me and uh, see if we can do something. 
Um, so Thomas, that the very nice thing is that Thomas a lot of work, so I can go faster on the on everything. But basically, what you provide is a vertex uh, that you can try to add to it for building reactive applications in Java. Uh, I don't like much to run reactive because it's very overloaded, and I prefer, uh, like, like Thomas also, to say uh, non blocking applications because that's what you do. And reactive is just a side effect because uh, well, a buzzword of different things. Uh, so it's quite popular. It's uh, sorting K stars on GitHub. It's been around since 2011, so it's uh, more than 10 years old now, which is a lot. <laughs> I started to contribute in 2014. Uh, it's based on Nelly, like uh, many uh, HTTP and TCP stacks to, today in the ecosystem of Java. And uh, everything went in the very nice differentiator and the differentiator again makes all the uh, solutions of it often is that in the context we don't use annotations. So if you, I mean, there are some people that they don't like annotations, they want to control everything. Uh, if you are quite do an good performance, and usually Vertex is, uh, is, uh, is a very good fit uh, for those kind of persons. It's not like a library on set on the framework, but it's still has a uh, very, very lot of usability and a lot of nice things. Uh, so in 2008, uh, now in 2013, um, yes, Vertex was at the top of the benchmark. You can see that. Uh, it was the fastest HTTP server, I think, at this time, well, among the benchmark, of course, uh, of course uh, non benchmark servers that will be faster. Uh, then, what happened is that a few years later, after we actually we didn't submit a Vertex for us, somebody did for us. Uh, one thing is that if you, if you want, you can even submit yourself a benchmark for somebody else or change the benchmark of somebody else or. or for anything, uh, it's, it's going to be reviewed and usually accepted. So it's not because uh, there is a benchmark, there is a, a server uh, benchmark in the, in the emperor, that it's the hard force of the frameworks uh, that maintain it. And uh, some, some people refuse to be in that with these factors, I guess. Uh, so yes, coming, coming back uh, in 2000, uh, 2017, uh, Vertex was not anymore at the top. Uh, so we can see here we can have vertex web uh, that's around 17, no 15. Uh, yes, another benchmark here. It's a database benchmark. We were like 42 or 43 rank, which is not great, right? But actually, at, at rank 79, we have PHP. And PHP was faster than vertex, so let's get to the problem, right? right? And that one is, it's a bit small, like uh, the benchmark didn't even complete. <laughs> uh, so when, after that, we, we what people on, on the list, on our mailing list, people start to complain and wonder, is, is Vertex still, uh, still fast, still very fast? Actually, in Vertex, we didn't change much. We was still the same library, and uh, I think we had more or less the same performances. Uh, so people, yes, were, were wondering Vertex uh, seems to be sneaky, sliding down the list. Um, it's not very good for Vertex. Uh, is the, some people were like, is the data, is the benchmark wrong? Which might be a solution. Uh, so what we decided at this moment is to, to because uh, we didn't spend time uh, on that, and we decided to come back to that and see what we can do. And, uh, where the problem were effectively happening, right? Was it in Vertex? Was it in the benchmark? Yeah. Or anything else? Uh, so a few warnings before we start. So first, we are talking about benchmarking in that situation. So benchmarking means you take a car, like a Ferrari, and you try to drive it as fast as you can. And simulation is more like you're more realistic. Like you are going to simulate a user uh, that we throw shopping carts and doing a lot of things. It's not like this kind of things that went nicely and we tend to some scenario. Uh, measure one guess. So you, are, you need to have a, a measure everything. And basically, when you change something, you, you take the new change and you check whether the, the metrics are better or worse. And you don't try to optimize and say, okay, that might be, uh, it seems good. Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's not. 
uh, use the baseline, of, of course. Uh, the baseline means basically it's when you start uh, to measure something, you define uh, what the baseline is, then you try to, to go about so it's kind of like a lower bound expectation, you would say. Uh, of course, different expectations. So you can, I mean, you can always try to optimize more, and at some point you have to stop. Uh, so you, you should define your target, and uh, when you reach this target, uh, you just stop improving. <laughs> And uh, recently, I did a new one. Uh, don't use your laptop, please. Really. Um, this, um, we use a few tools uh, in Java. So in Java, for, for performance, there are good tools and, and bad tools. Like, uh, it's like uh, hunters in France. Um, so what, what I what we basically use is uh, on, on the JVM today, I would recommend a single compiler. That's, I think, the best compiler on the JVM. Uh, it's very low overhead. And also, it gives results you can trust. Many of the profilers, they give you results and you cannot trust these results. I will not talk about that today, but uh, if you are interested in that, you can look at the presentation of uh, the authors of uh, a single compiler. Uh, you can find in the reference. And um, there are other tools like Perl, T-Trace. Uh, there's also Java Mission Control, which is like Java Flight Recording, which is quite interesting. And we also use Clean Graphs, and Clean Graphs is just a visualization tool that helps us to make sense of all the data we collect. So we, can, uh, we can have a good insight about uh, what we can optimize. And another tool I used, um, it's called JitWatch. So, uh, I can try to write that maybe it's a bit annoying, right? But I can tell you more. Let's go to. Oh, it's a little bit of crunch on the ticket box. <laughs> and it's a tool that helps us to, 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 to work with the Java just in time compiler. The Java just in time compiler, it's Something that takes the Java bytecode and translates it into assembly code executed by, uh, by the CPU. And when this happens, uh, we see what, what, what can be done. So I will first start with the plain text benchmark. So that benchmark is the most simplest one. Uh, basically, it's uh, just a web server that sends error words. It's a static hello world, so it's always the same bytes that are sent. Uh, one important thing about it is that it involves HTTP file file. Uh, usually when a browser sends a request to a web server, it, it sends a request and then on a connection, it takes the connection, sends the request, and then waits to get the response back before it can use the gate to set the connection. So let's say if you have 30 milliseconds of latency, from and that's what you have between France and uh, for instance, uh, Washington or New York. You have 30 milliseconds, so it means that when you get data, you have the computation time. It means your 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 connection cannot be used between for like uh, maybe uh, 17 milliseconds, and you don't have uh, infinite number of HTTP connections. So the browser actually turns on the website and only opens uh, five connections. Really. And HTTP pipelining is something that's not recommended at all to use the internet, but in this benchmark, we use it. And basically, what we do is that instead of sending one uh, HTTP request and wait for the response, uh, in this benchmark, just only the plain text, we send 16 HTTP requests and we don't wait, and we then wait for 16 HTTP response. It means that the server will be, will process a lot more requests with, with HTTP one, of course. Uh, than usually, than usually. So it's, uh, the CPU is going to process more data and all these things. And so it's, it's quite more aggressive than just uh, doing a simple benchmark with uh, the pipeline. So it's like an artificial way of it to put more, uh, more load on, uh, on the server. And as a side effect, um, as a side effect, uh, this, this benchmark is the bottleneck at the end of the day might can be the CPU and not the bandwidth. So basically it means in some case, the network wire in the benchmark in the servers 
is saturated to reach uh, the peak. And then you can see that if you want to compare, you can see that all the top contenders in plain text, they all have the same 100% performance. It means they all saturated the IO uh, network. Uh, and it, 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 it used from 256 to 16K uh, C2S connections. So let's see what we did uh, in this case to improve the performance of uh, So the first thing I will talk is about uh, uh, batching, batching uh, and flushing. Uh, flushing, uh, when you do a flush on, uh, on a Linux host, it, it makes basically a native call, a system call, not a native call, so it's wrong. A system call, why is that also native? But it's his calls and that is expensive. So we want to, to flush as less as we can, but we want to flush as often as possible. So it's always a trade off bit because if you flush too often, uh, you spend basically a lot of CPU time in the flushing. But if you don't flush enough, uh, then you have latency because uh, you don't send data and the client doesn't send data. If the client doesn't receive data, it doesn't continue the interaction. So there's no progression in the whole thing. Uh, yeah, so that's basically the pipeline to sing. So here we, on the, on, on the left side, we have the keep alive that I described before, which is the fortunately one's the traditional way to, to do requests, well, not the traditional, but the recommended way. And on the right, we have pipeline. So you see, we, we send three gets and we get three uh, 200 uh, OK response attributes on the wire that are set by the browser. And also, of course, all of that assumes that. Um, you can see the colors, you get always the, you get the responses in the same order that you send the requests, which is why we don't use pipelining on the internet because uh, some uh, intermediaries, like proxies, they might uh, interleave the same. So uh, when you get a picture of a cat, it might be uh, something a dog instead because uh, there will be some, some request and response uh, uh, mixed. Uh, yeah, so so that's not uh, something, that's not a problem we had in Vertex, uh, actually, when we had this uh, issue with performance. That was already optimizing Vertex. But basically, uh, what we do is that that's default pipeline throughput. So you can see that uh, if I pipeline one request or two requests or four requests or eight requests, I can see that the load on the server is uh, well, that's the throughput uh, on the right. The performance, you can see that it increases the number of requests, which will increase the performance, yes. And uh, yeah, so that's the default one pipelining. And here, if, if when we do receive one request, basically what, what happens is that um, the requests are very small packets, TCP packets. CP buffers. So when the client sends in the benchmark uh, the 16 requests, they will all be most likely in the same TCP packet. It means that on the server, the, the server is received at the same time 16 requests, 16 get. Uh, so here we have two behaviors. Uh, the first one is that we can flush every response. In that case, we do uh, three flushes. And in, if we batch the flushes, uh, we can see that we can see send all the response at the same time. And we just do one syscall uh, instead of doing 16 syscalls, which is important for the And that's what happens when we optimize the flush. Uh, you can see that you get, uh, despite value age, you get. Uh, much more, I mean, much more higher throughput than uh, if we don't. Um, so you know, that's that's a real case that happens. Um, I will not talk about. Uh, I mentioned the gel just in time compiler before, uh, and uh, that's one of the things that the JDM does. That's called meta planning. So we had this case when I. I see, I remember it was Vertex 3, 4, and uh, there is here, that's the hash commit of, uh, you can find it on GitHub if you use it. 
Uh, but basically, what we, what we did is that we, have, we added this, this uh, that was a bug fix we did. It. And so this is quite small, but if you look at it, it's uh, what we added some code, just some code, right, you see. And that code is inside, uh, if code instance of two friend section, then uh, it checks something and checks the HTTP version, and that's basically bug fix. So what we did is that we added this code. And this code was not even executed by the JVM in the benchmark because you can see it's, uh, it, it's guarded by uh, if cause instance of section, which means it affects uh, uh, only if, there is a, if, if the client is sending uh, erroneous data, which is not in the benchmark. And this was causing a 3% regression in, uh, in our server. So we wonder what happened. And, um, and, and you need to know that in Java, the JVM, at least the hotspot, uh, so it's not about RVM or the, I don't know how, how the uh, JVM works, but at least benchmarks are running a hotspot uh, JVM, which is uh, a JDK, uh, based on a JDK. And um, so we have the just in time compilation, and just in compilation takes the bytecode that is executed the most often and, and Complete compile it to just it, it, it interpret everything. And when it, it sees that the method is used a lot, then it starts to, to, to compile it as assembly because it's faster. And here, even when it started as assembly, there are several levels left. There is, there is in the first, some assembly is emitted very quickly, and it's not the best, the most optimized one. And if that's even used more, then this code is taken again and we optimize with other algorithms to try to get a faster version. And uh, so that's a very basic mechanism. So it means that um, it truly really depends on how your application is executed. Let's say if you have an HTTP server and your HTTP server, you can make a request on slash foo or slash bar. And slash foo and slash bar will have total, total different behaviors in the HTTP server. Uh, if you have a, if you send a lot of requests to, to slash foo, the JVM will optimize uh, your code and the, the current uh, everything for slash foo. And if you read slash bar instead, it will optimize for slash bar. So the, the result is very unpredictable. Not, not very, but it's quite, it's not, it's predictable, but you, you there is some degree of, uh, of variance. And uh, here, what's important is the kind of optimizations you can do. So there are several kinds of optimization. And one of them is very important. It's called uh, method inlining. Uh, method inlining is pretty simple. It's um, basically when in your code, when you write some Java code, you have a method that preserves about method, preserves about method. And basically, that's what you do most of the time. Method inlining just takes, uh, okay, this method is called by only these methods, and it's called very often. So, what I will do is that I take the body of the, of the method and I just merge it. In the other uh, body, and on so on, and so it, at the end of the day, you have uh, it takes it allows to do calls, methods calls, which are which are the cost in the JVM because you have to pass arguments and do a lot of things. Uh, and also, method inlining is a key for other optimizations, like for instance, in, in, in if you're in an object and you call a getter and uh, what you can do is you can take this together and as soon as we get the inline together, uh, we can see that in the JVM at this moment you can see other kind of optimizations that you can just inline the field and directly I say access the field of the methods. Uh, you can do these kind of things. Uh, so what I showed before uh, the the what the code that was added it was in this method. And you can see that this method is very long. Yeah. And it, it became a lot longer. And so it became longer. And so, where is my tool? My tool is here. So this tool is called JWatch. So I hope it's, uh, it's big enough for you. I don't know. But basically, JWatch, it's a, it's a small tool. When you execute your JVM, you, you give it startup options. So it's regular subscriptions and will, the JVM will create a log of a uh, lot of things of what's happening for the JIT 
so uh, some kind of, of drug. You see, it's a weird format. It describes, but obviously, it describes everything that the gene is doing. So, which methods are in, uh, combined? Which which one are not, and why they are not uh, combined? So, this tool helps you to to make sense and see what happened. That's interesting. And there's also a, a specific. Uh, yeah, yes, there's also a sandbox here. I'm not going to use it. The basic here you can write some Java code and run it with uh, G G coach run it and uh, profile it. Not profile it, but get the logs. And it, will, it will tell you. I mean, that's like an interactive tool, so you can learn with it. But now I'm going to use this and and if we look, so I know where to look. But basically, I when when I did that, I looked at at this method and I found it in um, here. So here we have a more, so it's a, it's a method called do message received in HTTP server of dollar server in Europe. That's what that's where it's called. So here we can see lot, a lot of things about this method. You can see also the byte code, but also if you have the right plugin, you can also see the assembly that was created by the JVM. So if you know about, about assembly, it's very cool too. If you don't, you can ignore it. But also what it gives is that it gives this visual, visual thing. It gives uh, this small uh, thing, so it's very small. I'm sorry for that. And uh, I might think this is why it's hard to make. But I can just try to. I would like to make a screenshot or make it bigger. I used to about to do it, but <laughs> but basically what we see that's the method call, the one we, we created. That's the method that, that we have. And here we can see that when it's green, it means it's cool it, because it means the methods, this method here, this method call, it was in line here. So this method was compiled, it's red, right, right means it's, it's compiled. Uh, so that one is uh, so that one is green, so it means it's in line. That one is green in line, and you can see another level of inlining here. So, and here that's the process message uh, method we, we have uh, here. Because this method is also very small, but it's called process message. And what it tells us is that if you run it, you can see it's a uh, inline, uh, so it's, it's written in line, and it says no. Uh, it says no to two, two big methods. So it basically means previously it used to be nine because it was small, but the small chunk of code we added make it reach the threshold and then it was not nine anymore. So it means it was we are losing performance here just because we added some code that was not even executed. And um, there is a more visual representation of, of what happens is that. Uh, and this flag graph. So that represents uh, performance and uh, that's a good one. I see. So that's not a good one. It's the allocation profile. Uh, it's this one. So that's a flag graph. Uh, that's basically that flag graph is a very powerful tool. What it means is that that's a method call. Like here, it's a unsafe read. So that's what I did here for you. Uh, and for instance, when I could read this method, we call this method here and also this method. And the proportion you have, the bigger it means it spends more time in this method instead of this method. So this way we can focus and see where the performance are. And this, this, this one is, is, is interesting because. Uh, you see here, this this this, this frame graph is specific, and here we can see the process. I can zoom, and I can see here the process message uh, method I have. And that benchmark is even more interesting because it, you can see there are two colors: there's blue and green. And and this 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 one, when it's blue, it means it's in line, and when it's green, it means it's not in line. And we can see here indeed that the Process message methods is not in line in the humble message of this one. So here we have a method call, here we have a method call, here everything is in line, and here we have a method call, and so on. 
So that's uh, also interesting to, uh, to, to use. So basically, in this in these methods, what we did is that we recognize that if you look at it and you try to understand that part, it handles only the other case. So it is not going to, to be used executed at all. And that one process the HTTP request. And that one process the HTTP um, body, like the chunks of the request, which are there. And what we did is that instead here we, we factored simply and put everything in the, in the, in the handle methods, the yeah, handle level of request methods. In that one, we did the same. We, because in, in, in tech component, we only care about it's a simple get, there's no body, so we don't care. And this one, it's uh, so we did that to reduce the, the size of the entire methods to make it inlineable again in, in, in the other one. And guess what we did with the last one chunk in the middle? No, we didn't. <laughs> uh, basically, we, when you have a request, the first, when you have errors, some of the, the get, and then you have the body of the errors. But the get, you, when you have a request, you always have a get method. So it will always be here, right? So what we did is that we, instead of putting it in the methods, uh, we just take it and it's like basically a, a manual in line, and so we are sure it's always in line. And also, there is one other thing to say when you play with this kind of thing in the JIT is that uh, the type of the method is, uh, is, uh, can be a blocker. But if you have too many calls, of course, at some time, the JPM cannot inline everything, right? it has to stop. So if, if you inline too many, if you have too many uh, def, uh, too large devs, it will also stop designing at some point. So it's always a question of trade off. All right. Um, another thing we did uh, is that we, we, we just avoid the necessary allocation. Uh, most of the time, everything we allocate in the JVM, but not most time, well, you need to be familiar with garbage collection. And uh, there are different kinds of objects. Some objects, they will live for a very short time. Is some for a longer time, it depends. Uh, usually, when you create object for a very short time, uh, it's fine because it's, it's collected uh, quickly and uh, efficiently by the first collectors. But nevertheless, if you, I'm not saying you should try to avoid allocations at all costs, but if you don't allocate something, it always means, even if it's going to be collected quickly, it always means less work for after because it's, uh, you don't just create a word Stronger for, for the job, for the job garbage collector. Uh, so you, most of the time you should not care about that. But on the very hard pass, it's it's very interesting to, to do that. And in vertex we have this code here. And uh, so that's uh, interesting. And we can see that we have the child methods, and it calls the execute from IO methods from the context interface. So here it's a basic Java. And when it calls it, uh, we use um, a, a, a runnable. And we use a, land, a Java Lambda, you see? Here. And this Lambda, what it does is that it refers the message here. And also the connection. You see, it, it uses the connection as the message. Uh, what does it mean? It means that every time we we call the context uh, execute from IO methods, this simple lambda it will instantiate an object because it has to reference the message object that is outside of the scope. Otherwise, it's, it couldn't, it, couldn't, it cannot be stateless. If we don't have this message, it could be stateless, and just one single instance of the lambda. Could So what we did is that we refactored also this code, and uh, the, the signature of, of uh, execute from IO was changed to add a message. And instead of having a runnable, we have a consumer already. So this way, when we execute it, we can uh, pass it uh, the message that is always processed because that's the goal of this method. So now instead of doing that, we, do, we use this, this new method. We pass it the message. And now we can see that the message is, is, is uh, well, there is an error actually. <laughs> I said. 
But it's nearly six because it might be going through some problem. But here, the opportunity itself to suggest that is the sage that this is a correct. That was correct. Uh, so this way, the, the message uh, that is the argument of the network does not, doesn't, doesn't click uh, from, the, from the lambda. And it means this lambda is perfectly static. I mean, it's static from this pair from, from, from the, with respect to the context. So it means we can only, we only create one instance of this lambda and uh, we don't need to do it. Any. So we save this allocation. Uh, every time we go through this and we have to think that here, the channel read method is called every time we receive an HTTP request or we receive uh, an HTTP uh, object like uh, a chunk. And uh, in that case, we can even do that. We can even instantiate ourselves uh, the handler message and make it static ourselves if we want. But that, that might be more clear for you. And uh, so the tool we used here again to do to find that, we can see it. If we use uh, async profiler, so async profiler is a profiler for CPU, but also for allocations. So if you look at, we did a small prediction on the on the allocation, and uh, so it's here, I think. So that's where that's all the allocations. That's how it's all the allocations. So if you look here. For instance, we can see that uh, that's the allocating HTTP server request because that's uh, what we do. So that's the, all, all those objects that are perfectly normal to be allocated by, uh, by, by Vertex 19. Like in this one, we, have, we allocate uh, headers because when we write a response, we need to allocate HTTP headers objects to contain the headers of the application, then to uh, transform into bytes and then send to this number. And here you can see that we have this specific header, we have this specific uh, instance. And you can see in the channel read, it's called link to time. There is something from the lambda. And that's the that's the allocation is the lambda we had previously. Uh, and now, if you look at the 36 um, one, so that that's in the uh, in channel read, that's actually in the channel read. Uh, it should not be here anymore. Yes, that's here. So we are in the uh, vertex inertia and reading here. We don't have any more this allocation. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. And that's a very great tool. All right. So that was only the plain text of benchmark. So let's uh, review hopefully what we did. Uh, of course, minimizing flushing is important. Uh, we can, in this kind of situations, we can optimize for the JIT. And actually, it's very often that people that write high performance benchmark, high performance servers and libraries, uh, they, they optimize a lot for mining. And uh, keep the GC cool is always good. And so at 1.15, uh, we were able, so that was in 2018, we were able to get a much better performance through, thanks to all these uh, improvements. And we were ranking uh, elements. So we are not, not, not the first, but not uh, but among the top 10 containers, of course. Um, and actually, these days, uh, the most fastest server are written in Rust, uh, if you look at what, what's happening. Sorry? All right, let's talk about database benchmark, database benchmarks. Uh, so, um, in Take Empower, there are five benchmarks. Uh, these are called DB, queries, fortunes, updates, cache, and queries. And when you when you submit the benchmark, you have the choice of three database uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL, or Mongo. Uh, and my advice here is just, just submit this PostgreSQL because that's the fastest. And you don't care about the users. And most of the time, the, the benchmark will use 256 predictions. And that's an important uh, number, actually. At round 14, uh, in Java, the best performance was achieved by JDBC and ICP, and not uh, anything reactive or blocking. So if you just have a subnet with JDBC, you will, that, that was the fastest uh, way to, to read the benchmark. 
Uh, Vertex was using a JPC actually that Thomas presented before, this over that full. And actually, if you think about it, uh, is asynchronous here uh, interesting? Uh, not really, because as Thomas said, uh, asynchronous and unblocking this is something when you have a lot of scalability and a lot of concurrent clients. And here we have uh, 256 connections. So it means that at most, we execute one query to the or a batch of queries uh, per connection, and that mean, at, at means at most 256 concurrent uh, queries and uh, 256 threads are required to do that. With Vertex, you just do one thread if you want, but in Servet, you will consume 256 threads, and uh, is the 256 thread a problem for, for um, 14 CPU, uh, a 14 core CPU. I don't think so. <laughs> so that's why maybe it was the best. Uh, so blocking was a good part of the issue here. Actually, if you think about it, it's in my opinion, uh, uh, take apart from the best part, does favor blocking designs. It doesn't favor actually uh, not blocking designs. Because for database, it's 256. And for Pipelining and plain text is it's 16k connections, but they never interact with the database. So it means you always straight send a response, so it's never a problem. So how did we handle that? Uh, first, we, yes, we focused on PostgreSQL, and all the bad results that the dramatic things I've shown before were well, due to stupid mistakes. Like for MongoDB, you are not using the dollar ID as an index, and if you don't do that, it's terrible. Uh, or for, for some of them, we are not using transactions with PostgreSQL. So when you do 14, uh, like a batch of updates, if you add them with transaction, it's faster. Simply because PostgreSQL knows when the work when the when the work starts and when, when it ends, so it can optimize the course. So we that at this moment I started to to wonder myself. Okay, I need to understand what's wrong with the database. Performance and can we get better? So, this moment I started to write my own uh, Postgre client uh, with Vertex and with, uh, I did that with a friend. And the goals were, were to create a simple uh, client, you uh, know, very straightforward and uh, very simple API. Uh, so, it was focusing yes on unblocking performance and lightweight, and, and there were no goals. So, the goal was not to be an abstraction, it was really to be only. Uh, at the time of only a possible client, and, uh, and that's it. So if you remember before, um, we talked about pipelining, and I hope uh, here everybody understood uh, pipelining, because it's going to play an important role here. But basically, when we access the database, and that database is not, it's not much different from uh, HTTP. Uh, when you want to do a query, you simply send a command to the database, that is for Postgre, and that's very similar for the other, and then you get just a response and you process that. So you, you do a query, you get a result, you do a query, you get a result. And at this moment, well, it's, it's not usual, usual to do a pipelining for database. Uh, for instance, uh, if you look at Redis protocol, which is very simple, it's a text protocol. Uh, when you look at the documentation of the protocol, they encourage you to, to do pipeline. They say, if you can do pipeline if you want, uh, you will, if you send uh, several queries in the same uh, pipeline, you will return them simply the same order. And um, that's what we did for Postgre. Uh, and uh, we didn't know if that will work, but actually that works. So you can pipeline with Postgre. It's simply that when Postgre receives a query, it takes the query, just, just reads the bytes for the query, do all the work, and then sends the response. And what happens with the other data that has been sent that is pipelined? It just simply stays in the TCT buffers or in the, of, of the, or, or the buffers of the stack at this moment. They just sit there, they do nothing. And when the server has uh, sent the response, it will just process the next query and so on. And it will return everything in the same order. As there are no intermediaries, well, there could be issues if you use uh, some proxy for that, this is for Postgre. And that's very interesting. That's what actually we did uh, 
for Robert, we implemented um, uh, a client that was able to do pipeline into Postgre. And that's how we were able to get better performance uh, uh, in this benchmark. Um, so that's a small uh, chart. Uh, I said, uh, I, I, I'm showing, but basically, uh, this, this simply run 5,000 queries. And there is uh, between the client and the server, there is 100 micro microseconds of ping. That means that if I send a query, it takes 100 microseconds to reach the server, and then I get the result uh, also in white number of microseconds. And that's a very uh, that's a very simple select that, that doesn't do any kind of work on the server. And we can see that. On the x-axis, we have uh, the level of pipelining, and on on the right, we have the total time to execute the 5,000 queries. Uh, you can see that it's much faster if you use vertex with pipelining. Uh, so that's that's for 100 microseconds. Who here has a server that is able to answer in 100 microseconds? Well, that's very that I mean, such kind of server is what you can find in very optimized base and these kind of things. Uh, usually, when you are in the cloud, you don't get that. If you get one millisecond, it's uh, more, much more realistic. Usually, you would get uh, between one and ten milliseconds, it depends on what you pay for. And when we increase the latency between the client and the server to one millisecond, we get this much more important kind of improvement you can get with uh, by playing the core database. Uh, so, is uh, is this a silver bullet? Uh, no, it's not a silver bullet. Uh, pipelining is interesting, but basically what happens is that with pipelining, you are able to save the half uh, of the work trip to the database. So the highest latency you have, the best gain you will get. But also it assumes that um, that's the time to execute the query is much uh, it's, it's, it's less, I mean, it's, it's, smaller, it's much smaller than the multi to the database. So if you just was plain select or just a simple insert, it's going to be very fast and Postgre will be able to respond uh, quickly, right? If you have a, a query that takes five seconds, then pipelining will be, will, you will have no game with that. On the contrary, it will even be a problem because um, if you have a very, uh, of course, that takes a lot of time, and you start to pipeline them, uh, you will just send a query to, to a connection that will remain busy. And you could have listened to another connection that was not busy. So you get uh, even worse results. So what you do usually is that you can separate the connection proofs. And when you know that you have a, a kind of query that, that is very fast to execute, you can just make a, a, a small pool of connections because when you pipeline, you don't need any connections and use it to, uh, to get uh, basic fast results from the database. So where did that uh, lead us? Actually, thanks to this, we were able to, to become the fastest uh, in this benchmark. And when that happened, I, I can tell you it was, uh, I was very happy. <laughs> I, I, did, I was expecting improvements, but I was not expecting that kind of improvements. Uh, it was even, I mean, it was so, yeah, here we are also, yeah. So that's Vertex Postgre first in 2018. And that was at this moment also the, when I brought this presentation, the, the CI, so that's the continuous integration for Java. So that's why it's, in, it's an official because it's not published on the, at this moment it was not published on the, on the Decompower of the benchmark website. You can see all the beneficial one. And so that's only Java. Let's go to us with PHP uh, or this craft language. And um, we can see that that vertex is second. But if you look at the code of Greenlightning and Wizard HTTP, Ratpad, PG Client, Micronaut, they use, they all use the vertex PG Client actually. Uh, actually, these days, when somebody submits a Java benchmark, for, uh, for first grade, we would use the, what we did in the user work. That's, uh, that's fun. I think I, I think I counted like seven uh, or eight, which I'm using that. So 
after we took the PTG client and we did, okay, what we did for PTG is great. We have a great API that is very lean, very simple to use and very performant. Then we started to write uh, other implementations. And then we also have high value to IT, but I'm not talking about that today because Thomas already did before. Thank you, Thomas. So the question is, um, is pipelining actually uh, something uh, that should be allowed in a benchmark? Because you can go fast, but can you go faster? And on tech employment, this month was uh, at uh, Google uh, uh, Gmail, uh, Google Group, and uh, people started when when we became number one, <laughs> beating everyone. Uh, so people was what did people? They they just look at our stuff, and then they look at the source code and they, they found that we are using pipeline. So they wondered. Uh, doesn't that took yes, the the guy was uh, he said another interesting bit that I noticed on the dashboard that that's what was very performant blah 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 apparently the active Postback clients used by them supports current pipelining up to 256 kilometers blah 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 and the guy is basically asking doesn't that conflict with the requirement that every result that every query results in a form the full one trick to the server but people started to look. There was a discussion and a debate. Uh, so that, 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 that one says that, but it also says it's a cool feature. Right? It's a cool feature, right? And uh, then the guy from Tech Empower, they said, uh, they responded and they said, in summary, you are leaning to work prohibited pipeline. If there are more opinion, we would like to hear them. So they, they say we, we would like to prohibit pipeline. And in that case, the access is back to, to, to the result optimizations. But they, they were open to, to that. And um, then they said pipelining can reduce the number of TCP packets, but in more, most importantly, it can keep the DB server busier. And that's what they actually do for HTTP, right? And what they believe it should be allowed. So at the end, they started that uh, we take a and decided to have a pipeline between the application and database. We clarify the requirements to call, to call this out specifically. So at this moment, I was very happy because, uh, because, because I did some things that have an impact on the. <laughs> On all, the, all the clients, uh, all the prospect clients uh, that are existing. And uh, now, if you look at the requirements, there is, uh, there is this small line uh, that says that pipeline is allowed. All right. Um, so, tonight, what did we learn? A lot of things, I hope, for you, for me, not much. Uh, say, as I learned that uh, the Spanish food is great again. <laughs> uh, so, yes, take on. Um, that's not uh, uh, intuitive, but take on power of framework benchmark. It doesn't favor uh, non blocking designs. It favors actually uh, uh, blocky, uh, blocking ones. And blocking ones, when they are well written, they are very fast. So trust us, it's not easy for us to be competitive in, in such benchmarks that is not uh, tailored for uh, non blocking. A non blocking Benchmark will, for instance, uh, do uh, 16k connections to the database. Uh, that would be uh, something that would be in our favor. Uh, yeah, JVM is a great place for performance. Uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, you can get extraordinary performance with JVM as long as you know what you do. And also, you have great tools. Uh, I showed you Acid Profiler, Fairgrounds, GTwatch. There are other tools, there are great resources, there are a lot of tools on YouTube that talks about performance. There are a lot of blogs, people passionate about that. And uh, that's very important. And if you want, you can go very far. Um, yeah, it's really a bit, I didn't mention that, but basically in Brentex, what we try to do is, uh, when you have an API, when you design an API, you can make very complex API or very, I mean, if the point is that, I can, if I can use the, the, the most simplest API to write an HTTP server, I will write a faster HTTP server. Like if, if I tell you in your application, you should not use strings, but instead use buffers, 
then my server will fast up because I will not have to convert the strings to vectors. Or you cannot use it so which if you have the you use HTTP addons, you have to use these predefined strings, then my fast up, then that will be fast up. Uh, so it means that the ergonomy, the usability of an API has an impact on the performance. And what you do about this is that you try to find the best trade off between performance and uh, usability. And that's not easy, trust me. Um, yeah, to that, I think that's also an important point is that I mentioned HTTP 1, I mentioned pipelining, and the thing is that uh, uh, I, I think here everybody heard about HTTP 2 that has been around for more than uh, 15 years, I'm not sure if I remember correctly. But what, what, what is HTTP 2? HTTP 2 is a way to say, okay, the bottleneck in the web is the number of connections because we cannot do pipelining and uh, you have to use one connection for request. And even with pipelining, we cannot do it on the web because you have terminal risk and zero risk. And even with pipelining, you get better performance, but if one of the requests is very slow, it could be your risk. So you don't get that much. You get benefits in some cases that you have seen before. HP2 is a way to say, okay, you multiplex things. So on the same connection, you have virtual uh, kind of virtual uh, streams and you can Basically, you take the request to slice them into smaller packets and we multiply them. Uh, it's a great way to performance. Performance and with one connection, you can achieve uh, uh, the virtual equivalent of uh, multiple HTTP one connections. For database, we don't have that. For database, the database protocols have been designed during the 80s, but so it was designed 30 years ago. And they have never been improved. So it means that this. this most protocol database protocols, they don't multiplex. And I think they should, because otherwise you don't have to do trace type pipeline to get performance, uh, better performance. So I hope someday, uh, like in Postgres, you could have a different uh, uh, protocol to be like an HP2 like multiplex protocol for Postgres. Uh, yeah, functionality protocols, concurrency matters. Yes, we often. Say, talk about performance on um, the JVM inside and everything. But when you have a whole distributed system, uh, if everything is fast, but between all your nodes, you use a poor protocol that doesn't give you the concurrency you want, uh, that would be a stupid thing to do. So you should try to use the fastest protocol you can that is the best adapted to your use case. All right, a few resources. Um, yeah, you can use if you want, and um, that's it. Um, I can take the question. Good luck here. Um, maybe it's even one, it just proves that I did not understand the lining at all. Sorry, maybe it just proves that I did not understand the lining. But in the example of Jarvan, where he's doing like, okay, we refer twice to the process. But that's not the other scenario. The real scenario, we don't know the speed at which we are going to get for that request. Okay. Yeah, so that's true. But so the question is uh, you, basically, you are saying that in, in the real case, you don't know that you are going to request, and you will never send to request in our own right? You don't do that, it's done for you. And basically, what we do in Postgres is that we share a, the same HTTP, the same SQL connection between different HTTP requests. So, normally, what happens is that uh, you have an HTTP request, you want to make an interaction with the database. So, you try to get the connection for the pool. If there is a connection, a pool in, a connection in the pool, you get the connection to your request. You get the response, and then the pool, the connection goes back in the pool. So it means for the duration of the request, the, the, the connection cannot be used, right? With, when you use vertex SQL client with pipelining, instead of saying, I want to get a connection from the pool to the request, just go to, you have to tell the pool, I want to make a query to the database. And the pool takes one of the connections. And just pipeline the request to the, rest, uh, to the database. So it means that if you have several concurrent requests uh, in the server, they can use the same connections. So it, 
que de extraveur que l'on fait. On ne peut pas de ces méchants de l'Ouest, mais comme pour multiple les méchants de l'Ouest, c'est la tuile de ces connexions incidentales. Il faut savoir que l'on est des ténèbres, c'est une transition. Ok, je suis un peu plus de jeu, mais pour le jeu. Right. Any other question? So the, the question I have is, I guess all of these tests are going to take into account at some particular moment from the same resources, the same hardware. Yes. So then the next year, or the next day, you can compare the previous result with your. Um, so you can actually see the difference between the execution that we did today from the previous. Yes. Year. Yeah. So, for our own case, we have our own servers, so we execute and it's always the same server. And if you go to the Tempora, uh, they also always have the same, so that's, that's in the right page. Okay. That's this one. So, here you can, that's the so we got. Yeah, so what we have here is that that's the official website with the rounds that I mentioned before. So you can see that you know, they, do, they do one round per year. So this year they did a round in July, and here they did a round last year. So they don't do one of them. So when you submit, you have to wait for one year that you are, that's everything's finished. And here in our environment, here you have source code requirements. That's what I mentioned before. They need an environment. And here they, they get uh, what they have as. Uh, so the uh, uh, physical hardware, that's what they use now currently for uh, the three Dell uh, for, for 40 servers and keep it in the same Dell So you get that. And when you submit uh, something to, to take on board, you can see that's the CI I mentioned before. And um, you can visualize the results. And so it takes a few days to execute. So that one started on 13th of November. It takes it took six days to execute. So when you submit it, then it goes, it's executed, and it takes that six days to execute all frameworks. Because now there are many, many more. I said before that now there are 400, but I think now it's uh, even more than that. And you can visualize the results here. And if you look here at single query, you can see that Vertex is still um, above the top. Um, it depends here on our second. So that's a little bit present. How long, so related to pipelining, how, how long do you wait before sending a connection, uh, a request to the database saying, okay, there's no other um, request that I can give you that on, on top of this? Uh, it will wait until there is something available. So when you use the SQL client, there is a you can specify the number of pipeline requests you can have on the same connection. By default, it's 256. But it, depending on your request, you can reduce it or increase it. And if the buffer is not full, I mean, I've got a single query to execute to the database. How long is it going to wait for 100 or 255 others before? Actually, getting saying, okay, the, the pipeline is not full, but I'm going to execute it anyway. It depends on, uh, on the execution of the server. The fastest to create are the, the, I say, as I said before, if you have slow queries, you don't use pipeline. Just use it if you have very fast queries that are, that have a uh, like instantaneous response. Oh. I think what, what you mean is uh, perhaps. <laughs> Does the client batch the, the queries to the database server, but that's not how it works. Um, no, just when, 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 when the query which comes in, it is sent to, to the database. And then we have a counter where, where we know how many requests are in flight. Mm -hmm. And if the in flight uh, count is less than the pipelining limit, we can keep on sending. Okay. But, okay. but it's not yes. batched. It's, as soon as we get it, we send it. Actually, we now have an uh, informant that say when there is a bunch of queries to use, uh, to use, 
Use the connection which has the least number of hit flights uh, because so if one query if one connection has like 10 meters of quality, we use the one with uh, this time instead when it's less on service space. Okay, so if you use more in flight connection, then you can catch the thing. Yes, yes, you get it now. Yes. So I'm a bit uh, concerned of how realistic this benchmarks are. Uh, it's not realistic at all. <laughs> so compared to the hello world example we said in the beginning, yes. The browsers don't do that, right? They don't find no. like 16 requests. No, no, no. no they, they cannot do that. It's not a, it's more, it's a benchmark. It's very artificial. Right, that's not what I think the database benchmarks are, they are only touristic. The database is more like, uh, I guess, every time I don't know, I don't know. you can try to take the car as fast as you can. And eventually you will crush the car. Any question? No? Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you everybody.